So, uh, so this is our final session before lunch, and then we get to come back, and I try to keep you awake for one more hour. Um, so we're going to see how this goes. Um, hopefully your, your heart is still able to receive the truth and you're not too filled up yet. Uh, we're going to be in John 3 primarily, so if you have a Bible, you can go there. I told you we're going to kind of unpack a few texts a little bit more fully. Um, and again, we're not going to do it full justice. Um, it takes, I think, more than one uh, sermon or talk to get through all of John 3. Um, but now we're going we're gonna to move a little bit. So we've looked at, right, missional living because you love Christ. Uh, we looked at gospel fluency and living on mission, and then gospel transformation. All right, that's kind of been our three big buckets, if you will. That if we're going to be mission minded people, these are all things that just, that I think scripture just calls us to, right? That we can't, again, live out the Christian faith or, or live on mission for Christ and not live authentic Christian lives. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you don't even believe the message you're proclaiming, right? So we need to be, uh, we need to hold all these things together. Um, and again, we don't do it perfectly, all right? So that's the beauty of grace and of God's mercy and patience is that we're never going to arrive. That's called heaven, all right? And we ain't there yet, all right? So, but we should be conforming more and more to Christ. So that's our, that's our hope. Um, and so what we're going to do this session and next session, and maybe even tomorrow morning, we'll see, um, is just look at how our sharing our faith is not a one size fits all approach. All right. So we're going to kind of get a little more into the, the nuances of sharing the gospel. Um, I think one of the great mistakes of, of the, of many modern evangel evangelistic movements of the past century is they made it a one size fits all approach. So maybe you like, maybe you got saved in the navigators. Anybody feel navigators? A couple people? Man, praise God for the navigators, right? I mean, how many millions of people have heard the gospel and been disciples of the navigators? Um, but but, if, but there, are, there are people that I meet that have been discipled by the navigators, and they have their way of sharing the gospel. And it's, just, it's like, whoop, here it is. Or maybe you've heard of evangelism explosion. They've got their way of sharing the gospel. Or maybe, maybe you're like, no, we're reformed, and you use way of the master. Great. They have their way. And, and, and they're all just ways of sharing the gospel. Um, and, and, and the problem, or well, first let me say this, in the kindness of God, I think he's gracious to use even our feeble efforts for his glory. And that's good news. Amen. Cause at some level, all of our efforts are feeble because we're still, we still have this thing called the flesh that we're working out. But I think this plan model has some real deficiencies. And so we're not going to give a plan. And that's actually Shameless plug, why I love this book, Honest Evangelism. He's not giving you a plan. I think plan evangelism is grossly deficient because it puts everybody in the same category. You approach all people this way, and Jesus never did that. And so we need to be mindful of how Jesus did evangelism. After, after all, he is the master teacher, no pun intended. So for starters, Jesus shares the gospel with an awareness of who he's talking to. So if you look at how Jesus shared the gospel with the woman at the well, it's quite different than how he proclaims the, this good news to the religious leaders of Israel. If you, if you look at how the gospel is proclaimed in Acts, Peter preaches a sermon that is perfect. I mean, truly perfect. It's inspired, so it's perfect. For a Jewish audience in Acts chapter 7. I mean, this most, I mean, it's for the most master, masterful biblical theologies in all of Scripture. And he's preaching to this Jewish audience that's going to be tracking with his stories. But then in Acts chapter 17, Paul preaches a totally different gospel sermon to, the, to, the, to Athens. Because they're not Jewish. They wouldn't pick up on all this Jewish stuff. But it's still the gospel. So the gospel doesn't change, but I believe the packaging of the gospel does. And I think that's one of the deficiencies of a planned approach. And, in our, and if we're aware of the audience that God's put before us, there's different aspects of the gospel that are going to receive different emphasis. So hear me carefully. The gospel is not changing. But we need to have God be gospel fluent, remember? When you're fluent in something, you know the right word for the right moment. If you've ever been to a foreign country and you're not fluent, it's painful. I mean, you've got like 10 words and you're trying to navigate these 10 words at the market. And you're like, this is not working. And so you resort to just playing shreds with everybody, right? You're just like acting it out and you're hoping that you get through. That's not how we should communicate the gospel, church. We should be fluent in the gospel enough that in any conversation with any person, we're able to say, okay, Lord, help me right now, but I want to bring the gospel to this person in a way that they can grab a hold of. 
growing up, um, my family, I don't know why, but we watched Abbott and Costello. Anybody even know who they are? All right, great, great, wonderful. Um, Because that was before my time, and honestly, before most of your times. Um, I love there's an episode where Costello's trying to sell a vacuum cleaner. I don't know if you remember this one, but it's great. You can look it up on YouTube. Um, And he keeps getting interrupted. Right, he, he's, he starts into the, his, his pitch on this vacuum, and then, then Bud interrupts him. And then he's like, and, there, and every time uh, Costello gets interrupted, he starts over from the beginning. And so he gets almost done, and then sure enough, gets interrupted. And he's like, hi, I'm so-and-so from the so-and-so vacuum cleaning company. And he, just, he can't even stop the pitch to answer a question. And sometimes I, I believe that these canned approaches to the gospel, we end, up sal- we end up sounding more like Costello selling vacuums than Christ making his appeal through us. And we want to be, I know it's a silly illustration, but we really want to have gospel fluency to the level that we can share the gospel with those around us where they're at and, and understand what they need to hear the gospel. And so we're going to use John 3 as a text. And our first kind of talk on this topic is going to be gospel fluency and religious people, all right? Uh, if there's a, this is a little bit more of a mouthful to, to write down, but it's this. Gospel nuance is required when sharing the gospel with those who are religious. Gospel nuance is required to share the gospel with those who are religious. You know, some people I, 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 you know, are, are, are not subtle at all. There's no subtlety in them. There's just like you know, everything is like um, just kind of, it is what it is, and there's no nuance, there's no subtlety. We shouldn't be that way with the gospel. We need to be able to take the gospel in all the glorious pieces, finer parts to those who are religious. Now, the reason I'm starting here is that I, I think there's a subtle lie that we can sometimes fall prey to. Okay, follow me for a minute. Let's say a guy moves in next door, all right? You have a new neighbor. Not only is this guy an atheist and a rank liberal, what he does for work is questionable at best, and you're pretty sure he's selling drugs out of his house. He's everybody's favorite neighbor, right? And you think to yourself, one, Lord, why did you put this guy next to me? I mean, couldn't you have gotten me a better neighbor? But number two, if you're thinking spiritual, you might think something like, man, this guy really needs Jesus. His life's a wreck. His family's a wreck. His mouth is a wreck. Everything about him's a wreck. He doesn't even mow his yard. He needs Jesus real bad. And let's play the scenario out a little different. A stable, upper upper middle class family who votes Republican. They even go to church. They move in next door. They're religious. They're not trusting in Jesus, but they're religious. And you have one another over for barbecues. The kids play great together. They sh- it's almost like you share the same house. The kids are popping back and forth so much. They're truly great people. And you're like, man, it would just be a little bit better if they just knew Jesus. But they're great. You see, the subtle lie is, at the end of the day, both people need Jesus equally. Because they're both going to die and go to hell. This is the best life they'll ever know. Because when they breathe their last breath, they're separated from God for all eternity. Because unless you're trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, regardless of your quality of life in this life, your destination's the same. And the reason I share that is because I do believe there are times that we as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, even though we know all these truths, that the religious people are like, oh, well, at at least they're religious. At least they're not as annoying at least we agree politically, right? All the things that we might tell ourselves. And the reality is they're just as lost. And we need to know how to interact with religious people because Jesus did. And frankly, even in our liberal state, there's a lot of religious people. There's a lot of spiritual people. Let's maybe put it that way, right? Sure, you are into the atheist and the agnostic. We'll talk about them later. But there's just, there's, there's, people are spiritual. How do we engage with them? 
So let's just break down John 3. Again, we're going to kind of high level. This is like a rock across the surface of a lake. We're not going to get too deep in this um, because we're not doing a full exegesis of John 3. But I think there's some things we can pick up on here. So the first thing is, number one, religious people need Jesus. Look at John chapter 3, verse 1. There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. At the very least, Nicodemus is intrigued by Jesus. Religious people, even though they might hide it under the cover of night, right? They're still intrigued by Jesus. It might be intellectual. It might be just, hey, what about that guy? There can be intrigue after all. I mean, the whole calendar revolves around this Jesus guy. What about him made him so special? Religious people, even religious leaders who do not know Jesus can still be drawn to him. They can still be intrigued by him. But notice verse 2 He comes to Jesus under the cover of night. Now, I don't want to make this too interesting, but throughout John, almost every time Nicodemus is mentioned, this is mentioned. He came at night. He came at night. He came at night. And I think there's the the, the key thing here is that religious people will often hide their interest in Jesus. They might come, but they're going to come sheepishly. They don't want to come actually letting anybody else know they're interested. You know, I think actually this is one of the ways that God uses the internet today. People are listening to sermons. And they can just, I'm just intrigued by Jesus. Happens all the time. I'm not going to come out and actually show up at a Christian church because after all, I'm religious. But there's, I'm I'm being drawn to this this Jesus figure. Who was he? What did he do? Why was he so special? You know, there's a magnetism about Christ. He's just drawing people to himself, right? Um, God is the great missionary God, drawing all people to himself. So this religious leader is being drawn to Christ. He's intrigued. He might be hiding. He's lost, but he's intrigued by Jesus. I would actually say that the plethora of religions in the world today, the plethora of spirituality in the world today is just proof that humanity actually is made in the image of God. We are spiritual creatures, correct? We can't get away from it. You go to the deepest, darkest parts of the world, places that have never been touched by Western society, they've got religion. It's a false one, but we are spiritual creatures. The problem is that billions of people would rather worship false gods of their own imagination than submit and surrender to Christ as Lord. Nicodemus is not yet ready to follow Jesus. We talked about that last night. I think he does by John 19. At this point, he's just going, there's something about this guy. There's something about him. And so I'm willing, and under the cover of night, to go talk to Jesus. But notice what comes next. This is number two here. Religious people don't think they actually need Jesus. All right, so Nicodemus, praise God he's being drawn. Praise God he's intrigued. But if you look at verse two and three, he doesn't actually think he needs Jesus. Actually, this is just verse two. He comes to him by night and says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Notice that Nicodemus asks Jesus, asks Jesus no questions. He doesn't even say, what can I do to have eternal life? He's not even going there, like like we see later with the rich young ruler. Spiritual pride likes to tip the hat, if you will, to Jesus without actually submitting to Jesus. So this is like Nicodemus throwing, this is like Nicodemus, the irony is crazy, like throwing breadcrumbs to Christ. Hey, Christ, we know that you're a Messiah, you're the rabbi, not Messiah, you're the rabbi. And maybe you come from God like a prophet because after all, nobody can do your signs unless God is with them. And so it's like Nicodemus is affirming that Jesus is something special as if Jesus needs Nicodemus' compliments. But that's what the proud heart does. Spiritual pride can kind of, oh yeah, yeah, I'll pat Jesus on the back. But notice verse two, how it finishes. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, religious people, they're often interested in the supernatural. I mean, after all, religious people, by definition, are spiritual. So they believe in something spiritual, something mystical, maybe something supernatural. And so this kind of longing for signs and wonders, it can cause them to want Christ for all the wrong reasons. We see it today, don't we? It's all around us. I mean, all the crazy, I mean, whether it's false religion or Christianity, I would actually say still false religion under the name of Christianity. Signs and wonders. God will give you your miracle. He's like, hey, Nick, hey, Jesus, you got some pretty cool signs you're doing. 
Maybe God's with you because you got some, you got some signs you're throwing down. You see, he's not actually thinking he needs Jesus, but he's just intrigued by Jesus. Interesting, I think, just for us today, religious people sometimes, I'd actually say often, are more willing to talk about matters of faith, even though they aren't necessarily thinking that they need Jesus. Because in actuality, they are just as sincere about their faith as you are about yours. The only problem is sincerity doesn't, sincerity doesn't make them right. I actually love when religious people move into my neighborhood. I got a bunch of Muslim neighbors. It's great. You know why? Because you can talk about faith. They're not, they're not pulling the classic, hey, we don't go there. No faith, no politics. They're like, hey, yeah, we're religious. I'm like, sweet. Because now we can talk about faith. And they're okay to go there. And here's Nicodemus. He's a man of faith. So what's Jesus do? He capitalizes on the opportunity. They're not saying, hey, we don't, we don't do that. No, they're willing to talk. So what do, what, what, do we, what do we do, church? Take advantage and be willing to talk. So what we see Jesus doing next is the third, I think, big point of this text. Religious people need their presuppositions confronted. Their presuppositions. We all have them. Your biases, the things that you believe. Maybe they're based, they're probably just based on whatever your version of truth is. But religious people, they need their presuppositions confronted. And so this is where we're not going to go as deep because I already talked about this a little bit. Jesus is going to drop the new birth on Nicodemus at this point, right? He's religious. He's devout. He is the teacher of Israel. He is up there in the upper echelon of religious people in his society. It's like, hey. I'm going to drop some truth on you that you need, Nicodemus. So what's he say in verse 3? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, here's the point. All false religions are at some level the same. Okay? Ready for it? Here's, here's all false religion. You can do something to merit the favor of God that you created. Whatever, whatever, whoever you believe to be God, whether you, whether you call that God Allah or Krishna or whoever, whatever God you created, you could do something to earn his favor. Does that make sense? This whole, like, by being saved by grace through faith, that's only biblical Christianity. Everything else, if you put it all in a pot, boil it down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, there is, there's a version of God you've created, and you can do something to earn his favor. Are you tracking with me so far? That's false religion in a nutshell. Now, I know it's deeper than that, but it's not less than that. So Jesus, knowing the heart of Nicodemus, what does he do? Well, he makes it abundantly clear that there is absolutely nothing that Nicodemus can do to make himself right with God. That's what he tells this ardently religious person. Because what does a religious person think? I can do something to be right with God. And actually, I am doing something. Have you ever talked, really, really engaged with a Mormon? I've done a, I, I've done a lot of work in Utah, and so, um, yeah, talking with Mormons, it breaks my heart. I mean, they literally believe that if you do X, Y, and Z, that you can be temple worthy. I'm like, what a denial of the gospel. Jesus alone makes you worthy. Not in their system, though. And I, I, I got married here. I went on my mission. I don't do this, 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 and this. And I, was, I am now temple worthy. And I'm like, really? Like, that's what you're trusting in. But they're just like Nicodemus. I'm doing all these things to merit the favor of God. So what does Jesus tell him? Hey, Nicodemus, you can't do anything. You must be what? Born again. You see, the new birth, this isn't a seminary class. This is evangelism. He's not trying to get a, he's not writing a book for some theologian to read called the new birth. He just says, you must be born again. Oh, and by the way, if that's not deep enough, he says, hey, you can't see the kingdom of God. Oh, and then he talks about being born of water and the spirit. And if you want to know what that means, go listen to Pastor Tony's sermon on the text. No, but really, it's a work of God. You're born of water and the spirit. You're, it's being cleansed. It's an Old Testament reference that you're being cleansed. You're being made new. 
And then he says in verse 8, and I love this. Or let's do 7. Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born again. So Jesus goes deep with Nicodemus. And, and you might say, well, why did he have to do that? Why would Jesus press so hard and so deep in an evangelistic encounter? And I'm going to give you an answer that I hope it's not confusing, but I think it's this. When you're dealing with religious people, saving faith can never be syncretistic. You know the word syncretism? You're syncing one religion with another. And he said, no, 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 Nicodemus, I'm not finding common ground with you. See, that's what we try to do in our flesh. Hey, I'm talking to this person. Let's find some common ground. We'll be friends. Maybe we'll kind of, we'll, we'll find where we agree. Jesus isn't playing that game. It's like, Nicodemus, you're lost in your sins. You must be born again. And so he is making it so painfully clear that you can't merge false religion with Christ. For someone to come to the true God of heaven in saving faith, they must forsake all the false ideologies and presuppositions of whatever religion they're a part of. You can't hold on to Christ and these other things. So what, what must you do? Be born again. You see what Jesus is doing? He's making it clear that in Nicodemus' framework, he could get to God by his works, by his merits. And Christ is setting the, setting the score straight. I mean, have you ever talked with a Hindu about Christ? Have you ever talked with a Hindu? It's, it's actually pretty great. And they'll believe like that. Honestly, they'll believe in a heartbeat. As long as you can add Jesus to the other three million gods they believe in. They're great. They're like, oh, yeah, we love Jesus too. We'll just start praying to him. We'll put him on our shelf. It's a great, I mean, if, if, if that's all it is, then you win. Oh man, this, this person converted today. But what didn't you do? You didn't give him the gospel. You didn't tell him that every other God is false. You didn't tell them they have to forsake all other gods, that there's only one way to get to God, right? So Jesus isn't playing this game of, hey, let's bring your religion along with my religion and we'll bring them together and we're good. And we can't do the same today either. See, Jesus knows what Nicodemus believes. Now, of course, Jesus has the upper hand because he knows the heart of man. We don't always know that, right? Right? But he does know what he believes, and so he speaks in such a way that makes Nicodemus question his presuppositions, makes him question his biases, his, his, what he thinks is right. And notice that Jesus only uses this strategy this time. So when you go to the next story of Jesus sharing the gospel in any other gospel record, we don't have a, we don't have a can, two-step, oh, Jesus did John 3 again. This is how he did Nicodemus. And then he's going to do it again in John 4, but it looks different. And again in John 5, but it looks different. Because he's sharing the gospel in a way that reaches the person he's sharing it with. And this is what I believe gospel fluency looks like. It's fluent in gospel enough to nuance the gospel to fit the need of the occasion. But like we talked about in our first session today, it's deep too. So he's not just surfacing. He's not just like, oh, let me just kind of hit some surface issues for you. Oh, he's just like, hey, we're going to go to the bottom of the ocean right now, Nicodemus. You don't know what it means to be mine? You're born again. And you've got to get there even to become my child. Well, notice though, okay, so Jesus, Jesus is sharing the gospel. He's confronting Nicodemus' presuppositions. And in verse 4 and verse 9, Nicodemus is thoroughly confused. And this is actually comforting, all right? So be comforted. Verse 4, Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then verse 9, how can these things be? Coming to Jesus by faith is different than every other religion in the world. I hate even use the word religion because of how I think it's polluted and corrupted today. But James does talk about pure religion, so it's not a bad word. But, he, but Jesus, coming to Jesus by faith is different than every other faith system that's ever existed. Nicodemus gets religion. I mean, he, he is a leader of religion in his nation. He's not religiously ignorant or foolish. But this whole gospel thing, it's radically different than everything else. 
There's nothing like it in the world. And so Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus, and yet there's still confusion on the part of Nicodemus. And here's the good news. When we talk about Christ with the unbeliever, you can expect confusion. Because this doesn't make sense to the natural man. Colossians 1 actually calls it foolishness. It's the wisdom of God, but to man it looks like foolishness. Like, wait a second. I can't do anything to get right with God? Like, I'm actually lost in my sins, dead in my transgressions, an enemy of God, hostile to him? What is going on with that? All I do is I repent and believe, and God's giving me this new heart, and I'm forgiven? What? That's so weird. Can't you just tell me to go to church and stop being a bad person and maybe to read my Bible and do a few good deeds? That would be easier than this because that's what religion does. Just give me the steps. I'll follow the steps and I'm in the club. That's not the gospel. And so Nicodemus is confused and frankly, those we talk to today will be confused. And so take this to heart. Nicodemus doesn't get it, but Jesus doesn't water it down. You see, that's the temptation. Okay, they're confused. I must have blown it. Maybe not. Maybe you just gave the true gospel and the unbeliever is just like, yep, don't get it. And then we just say, Lord, turn the lights on. Because if you don't turn the lights on, they're never going to get it. Jesus doesn't water water it down. He doesn't make it more palatable. He doesn't say, let me try again. If you read the story, read it with this lens. Jesus doubles down every time. Nicodemus is confused in verse 3. So what's Jesus? Or verse 4, Jesus then dives back into the new birth. Nicodemus is confused in verse 9. Jesus dives back in in verse 10 to 15. He doesn't go, oh, I'm sorry, Nicodemus, you didn't get it that time. Let me change the gospel. Let me give you a new message. Nope. That's what you need, Nicodemus. You think you can earn my favor by your good works, and you can't. You must be born again. So then Nicodemus, Jesus, after Nicodemus is confused in verse 9, Jesus, I think, in a rebuking manner, says, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? That's a judgment on Israel, by the way, right? You, of all people, should know this, and you don't, because you're, as a nation, you're blind. And so then he gives him this, like, little sermon. Truly, truly, I say, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony, and, and I've told you earthly things, and you don't believe. How can I tell you heavenly things? In other words, Nicodemus, you're supposed to be spiritual. You can't see spiritual things. You can only see carnal things, earthly things. That's what the carnal man does. He says, I'm trying to tell you spiritual things, Nicodemus. And so then he ties it into Nicodemus' Old Testament knowledge. Again, he knows his audience, and he says, so Nicodemus, no one's ascended into heaven except the one who, who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, right? He's quoting Numbers here, Numbers 21. And then he just says this, and this is what I, I want to press home, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus doesn't again, again, he doesn't water it down, he doesn't back off. He confronts Nicodemus with the need for faith. Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness. All who, or the Son of Man must be lifted up, lifted up to, and whoever believes in him, who's him? The Son of Man, who's going to be lifted up. Whoever believes in the Son of Man will have eternal life You see, religious people are often confused spiritually. And Jesus' point is they they must believe in him if they're going to have life eternal. And that is that hard stop right there. There's no middle ground. There's no common ground. Jesus doesn't have an intellectual debate where they both agree on certain things and disagree on other things. Jesus simply calls Nicodemus to believe. And again, I think that's the pain point often in our evangelism. We just want to have a conversation about faith with our coworkers. What does Jesus do? If you don't believe, Nicodemus, you don't have eternal life. Jesus, that's offensive. It is. The gospel's offensive. He's not being a jerk about it. He's just preaching the gospel. And if you don't believe, there is no life eternal. But I'm a good Mormon. But you got to believe in Jesus. But I'm just a good person. But you got to believe in Jesus. But I go to temple every day. But you got to believe in Jesus. 
See what he's doing? Nicodemus, I know you're a leader in Israel. I know you're religious, but if you don't believe in the Son, you don't have eternal life. He presses home the point with absolute clarity. But notice what Jesus does next. This is, I love Christ. I love the heart of Christ as he is engaging in, with Nicodemus. Um, I don't know about your Bible. My Bible has one of those little like breaks in the chapter here. I don't like it because I think our minds tell us that it's a different story. It's a different narrative. It's not. It's the same narrative. He's talking to Nicodemus. And who does Jesus give the most profound verse on the love of God to in the entire Bible? Who does he give it to? Nicodemus. Jesus isn't ticked at him. He's not like, you knucklehead. Uh, oh, you're supposed to be the leader of Israel? What an idiot. No, to Nicodemus, to this religious elite, what does Jesus tell him? Oh, for God so loved the world. Nicodemus is going to instantly know, I'm a part of that. I'm a part of that. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Saying to me just real quickly, Jesus, and I'm just going to apply this to Nicodemus, all right? There's so much more to be said about this verse, but let me just say a few things. Jesus is not irritated by Nicodemus. I like to refer to this as gospel tenderness. Jesus is not hostile to religious people who are lost. He's not angry at the false teacher down the street in the sense of, how dare them? No, he wants them to come to Christ. He wants them to hear the truth. Jesus and I'm sorry, far too often, followers of Jesus, we get in debates with religious people, and we think that if we win the debate, somehow we're better than them. Brothers and sisters, we would do well to have Christ-like gospel tenderness towards those who are blinded by false religion. I see Christ having pity on Nicodemus. Nicodemus is blind by false religion. He's even taken the Bible and made it false religion, which do people do that today? All over the place. So in the name of the Bible, they have a false religion. And Jesus isn't, isn't blowing him up. Jesus loves him. And he declares John 3.16 to this guy, to this religious false teacher. Just let that sink in for a little bit. Because we can be bombastic and harsh and sometimes treat people like they're the enemy. Just let me say this clearly. The devil's the enemy. Ultimately, Christ, is, Christ died for sinners that they would repent and believe the gospel. So we bring the love of Christ to them, just like Jesus proclaims it to Nicodemus. So Jesus is not irritated by this man. Jesus then expresses deep gospel compassion for him in verse 16 still, that he gave his only son. Nicodemus, I love you enough that, I mean, God loves you enough. He sent his son for you, this gift of Christ. He gave his son to this proud, blind, false teacher Jesus declares the most clear statement regarding God's love. He gave his son. It's interesting, actually, and I don't have time for this, but in John 4, it's actually Jesus goes from this, this global gospel in John 3, 16, and John 4, he proves it, because who does he go and save? The woman at the well. John, end of John 4, the centurion comes to Christ. John 5, he heals a man at the pool who's been lame his whole life. I mean, John is just going to prove, I, Jesus really does love the world. But who does he give the message to? A religious false teacher of Israel. It makes me wonder how Jesus would respond to the JW or the Mormon who knocks on his door. I don't think he'd be irritated. I don't think he'd want to catch him with their bad exegesis. I think he'd love them and he'd proclaim Christ to them. Now, they might be confused because they're blinded in their sins. But we know he'd love them. And how do we know that? Because he did it in John 3. Right? He's not angry at those who are lost, even the religiously lost. Yeah. He's gracious and he's loving, and he declares that to them with absolute clarity. And then, as we've seen already, Jesus calls Nicodemus to saving faith. So we read John 3.16, and we, we look at it and we say that for whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But he gave this to a person. And the person's name is Nicodemus. So this isn't just this general, God loves the world, and, you know, it's specific. There's a guy he's talking to. I love the world, and whoever believes, and guess what, Nicodemus, you're part of the whoever. If you believe, you'll have eternal life. So even in that, what's he telling him? Yeah, right now, Nicodemus, you don't have eternal life. 
I know you think that you're following Yahweh. I know you think that you're one of the chosen people, but you're not. You don't have eternal life. But if you believe in me, you will. You can be a part of this whosoever. And again, I think it's it's imperative for us to say this over and over. In modern Christianity, there's this readiness to talk about God's love, but a slowness to call people to actually change what they believe. That sound, we're like, ah, that's just, that's a little hard. So we'll just talk about how God loves them and how God is for them and how Jesus died for them, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He consistently goes past that pain point and says, will you believe? If you believe, you'll have eternal life. And if you don't, there's no eternal life for you. Will you st- and even when you think about religious people, will you stop believing in what you currently believe in? Because you have to actually repent of your false gods, repent of your false religion, repent, repent of your false hope, and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so Jesus continues on, verse 17, right, with that declaration, God did not send his son of the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. Again, I think Jesus is diving deep with Nicodemus, and we could get lost here for some hours. But I think Nicodemus was expecting the Messiah to be the deliverer of God's people, meaning they would no longer be in bondage. They would be set free from Rome. Um, to use the American phrase, God would make Israel great again, right? That's what Nicodemus wanted. Hey, make us great again. And so what's Jesus saying? Hey, hey, Nicodemus, time out. I just want you to know something. I didn't come to condemn. The other word for condemn is judge. Because what's Nicodemus hoping for? I really believe that all the Jews were, even the disciples, all right, I know you're the Savior, but I can't wait till you, till you get them, God. Get them good. Get them good and restore us to our former glory. So Jesus is just making it. So he's diving deep again. He's not skipping along. The, he's not skipping a rock along the surface, as it were. He's telling Nicodemus that I came to save, not judge. I, I care about your soul, Nicodemus, not about our ethnic our ethnic prowess in the world as a nation. Jesus came to save. It's so clear. Even that's what John the Baptist declared in John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what's the strategy? I think Christ's strategy is brilliant, obviously, because it's Jesus. Lift up Christ as the Savior of the world. I think when, you, when we're dealing with evangelism opportunity or missional opportunity with people who are religious, what do they need? They need the same thing everybody else needs. In one sense, Christ is the Savior. You see, you think it's your good work saving you. You think it's your church going that's saving you. You think it's your good deeds or you're just a better than average human being, your philanthropy that's saving you. No, you need the Savior, Christ alone who is the Savior. So he declares it, declares it to Nicodemus, and then we're going to wrap it up here with John 3.18. Religious people, they need to know the love of God, but... Fifthly, they need to know about God's judgment. They've got to know about God's judgment. Verse 18, remember, we, we can use this text and we can, we can think nebulous. Whoever believes, but who's he talking to? There's a person in front of Christ. Don't forget it. There's a person. It's at night. It's a one-on-one conversation to the best we know based on the text. Nicodemus, whoever believes in him, who's him? The son. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, not judged. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Wow. I mean, that's just one of those, just let that sit for a while, even if you've read it a thousand times. Remember last night, we talked about how the woman at the well, when Christ confronted her, she just, you can just almost tell, she leaves her pot, she runs into town and says... Come and see the man that told me all I ever did. Remember we talked about how he knows everything about me, and yet he does not condemn me. You see, that's what Jesus is doing here in John 3. He's saying, if you believe in me, there's no condemnation. I think if there is anything that we need to lift up more and more as we live on mission for Christ, it's those two words. There's no condemnation. He doesn't, he's not holding your sin against you if you believe. He's not making you pay for your sins if you believe. Because he took your condemnation. See, there's nothing like that in all the world. Every religious system, every religious system of the world doesn't have a category for what the Bible calls substitutionary atonement. No, no, you pay for your own sins. 
Good karma, bad karma, purgatory, whatever you call it, you're going to pay for it. And we actually say, no, 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 he, t- he took it. He took it. No condemnation. He bore it. Brothers and sisters, this is so crucial. And I think today we've lost the gospel in many ways because we make the gospel about things like doing good deeds. We make the gospel about cleaning up our city and doing social work. And these are all fine and good things. Don't get me wrong. We should be model citizens as gospel-loving people. But the gospel is about one thing. Sinful people no longer stand condemned before God by faith. Sinful people no longer stand condemned before God by faith. And in this, you know that Nicodemus is getting, he's getting stung, all right? He's getting hurt by this because here's the backhanded truth. What is Jesus telling Nicodemus? As things currently stand, you are condemned. But you don't have to say that way. You see, that's where we stop. We don't get to that. We, we stop shy of that pain point in the gospel. He's like, Nicodemus, whoever believes is not condemned. But right now, you're not believing. So what does that mean about you, Nicodemus? You are condemned. And so here, I think we need to have a gentle but holy boldness like Jesus when we talk about the gospel to those who don't know him. You see, the conviction of the gospel comes not when you tell people that God loves them. The conviction of the gospel comes when you tell people that there's consequences for sin or otherwise known as condemnation. There is judgment for sin. And yet in the same breath we declare, whoever believes in him is not condemned. You see, we don't leave people with, hey, you're condemned, deal with it. That's not how Jesus dealt with it. He actually, no, no, there is condemnation if you don't believe, but oh, if you believe... If you believe, there's no condemnation. So Jesus finishes the logic. He says, not believing, not believing in Jesus is present day and eternal condemnation. Did you see how the verse finished? Because he, oh, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. He's already under the judgment of God in this life and in the life to come because he's not believing the name of the only son of God. So if believing equals no condemnation, then not believing equals immediate condemnation and eternal condemnation. So that's what we're holding out to the entire world. There's no middle ground. There's no straddling condemnation. It's like either you are condemned or you're not condemned. Where are you? And the only answer, the only, the only solution is faith in Christ. Will you place your faith, and remember we define faith like Jesus, not just mental assent, We're defining faith carefully. Will you place your faith in Christ alone? Because if you do, oh, hallelujah, he took your condemnation. But if you don't, you're still under the condemnation of God. You see, brothers and sisters, I mean, just I I know this is just a a, a 30,000 foot flyover, but do you see how gospel nuance is required to share the gospel with religious people? Because we're not just finding common ground. But actually, I think we see in Jesus an example of somebody who knew enough about the religion of the person he's talking to. He weaves that into even how he shares the gospel. He knows the presuppositions that Nicodemus is going to jump on. So he knows that if he tried to find common ground with maybe the Old Testament law, Nicodemus is going to go, oh yeah, I do that. I'm good. Thanks, Jesus. So Jesus just says, you know what we're we're going to do? We're going to go straight to the reality that you can do nothing to earn the favor of God. And it pierces Nicodemus to the heart. We know that because by the end of the gospel, he is following Christ. All right, here's my disclaimer every time. There is not an excuse to stop living on mission, ever. So when we're talking about how we need to have gospel fluency so that we can nuance the gospel to share the gospel with people who are religious, what we're not saying is, well, until I hit a certain point of maturity, I don't have to share the gospel. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is, as always, dig deeper into the gospel. The more you love Jesus, or or I'm sorry, that you will love Jesus more, and you will know how to share him better. And this is where I don't think, I I think we need to be so careful, because we're not trying to win arguments with any one person. That's not what this is about. It's about knowing the right words for the moment. So if you think about missionaries who go overseas or to a foreign culture, 
They, will, they, they are wise to study the religion of their people. Why? To know how to nuance the gospel to those people. So we would be wise to know the belief systems of those we are around, not to win some argument, not to catch them and say, you're so dumb. No, but to know how to bring the gospel with God's grace and God's mercy, with nuance to such a, to such a degree that it would pierce their hearts. And that they're not going to come away thinking, yeah, this is great. I agree. We agree. We're all good. No. No, then we just allowed people to be condemned in their lostness or, or to be justified in their lostness and not know they're condemned. So brothers and sisters, let's be people who dig into the gospel so that our love for Christ will grow and that we might be better prepared to actually share the gospel with religious people around us. All right? There we go. Chris, 1202. I'm getting better and better every time. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe the next one will actually finish on the dot. Probably not going to happen. Yeah, okay. Probably it's a nice not. try. Probably not. <laughs> All right, thank you.